Well, welcome to this talk where we're going to be thinking about infection. What infection is and how we recognise infection. Now, infection means the presence of microorganisms in the body. So normally the tissues of the body are supposed to be sterile. But if we get viruses or bacteria in the body tissues, this will cause infection. And if these are affecting the body so that the body is having an overall infectious response, an overall inflammatory response, we call this a systemic infection. We would normally say we don't feel well. So when you have this overall infection, the infection that's affecting all of the body, we have a systemic infection and we don't feel well. We think, oh, yeah, I'm just not feeling well at the moment. And this general feeling of not feeling well is called malaise, general malaise. So you have malaise, you just don't feel well. So the patient will report that symptom to you. But there's also signs that we can look for. So when someone has an infection, very often they go pale in colour because the body is trying to conserve heat. So they look a bit pale so that the blood vessels near the surface of the skin go down. They vasoconstrict and that means there's less blood going to the surface of the body and someone can look pale in colour. That's called pallor. And as well as that, when someone's unwell, if they have a systemic infection, then the body often tries to raise the body temperature to cause a fever. In order to raise the body temperature, it makes the person feel cold. So they put on lots of covers to try and warm up or they go to bed or they sit in front of the fire. And then they can become shivery. And if they've got a full on shaky, shivery condition, that's called a rigor, as the skeletal muscles contract back and forward to try and generate heat to build up the body temperature to give rise to this fever. And then very often people feel tired when they have systemic infection, whether it's bacterial or viral, and they don't want to exercise. They just want to laze around and do nothing. And it's very important that they do because sick people should not be taking exercise. And the other thing that you can sometimes get an infection is altered mental status, AMS. Now, if the infection is bad, especially in older people, they can become very confused. I tend to get a bit grumpy and sometimes a bit anxious when I have an infection. So it affects the way your mind is working, this altered mental status. But of course, in hospitals, we spend an awful lot of time looking at the basic physiological signs of the patient. Now, in the UK, we call these the observations. We observe the temperature, pulse, blood pressure, oxygen saturations. In the States, they often call this the vital signs. So in the States, someone might say, go and record their vitals. Whereas in the UK would say, go and record their OBS. So I'll go in and assess a patient. I'll come out and the doctor will say to me, what were the OBS? That means what were their observations? What were their temperature, pulse, blood pressure, oxygen saturations? So let's look at those next, these observations that we can make, these vital signs that we can make measurements of to inform us about the patient's condition. Now, in hospitals all over the world, we use these observation charts or vital sign charts. And we put the date and we put the time because what's important when we're taking observations is not just what the physiological observation is, but what trend it is following. So, for example, is the temperature going up? Is the heart rate going up? Is the blood pressure going down? Are the oxygen saturations going down? The trend is very important because it indicates the direction of travel of the patient's condition, the way the patient's condition is evolving. So trends are very important and we always do serial observations. So if someone first comes into hospital and they're not very well, we might put them on half hourly observations or one hourly observations. Later on, we might lower that to two hourly observations or four hourly observations because getting the trend is very important. Now for respiratory rate, we're taking the normal respiratory rate as 12 to 20. So the respiratory rate is one breath in and one breath out, and that equals one respiration. So what I'm going to do is breathe into this microphone, and uh, every time I count one, I'm going to tap my finger. So that was four. Four breaths in, four breaths out. That equals four respirations in that time period. 
and we count this for one minute. And we do this with our watches, but it's much easier if you've got a second hand so you can um, see it easier. You can do it with digital watches as well. Now, the problem is if someone's getting a fever because they've got an infection, then to make the fever, they have to increase the metabolic rate of the body to generate more heat. There's going to be an increased metabolic rate and the shivering is going to be there to use up energy. And of course, metabolism needs oxygen. So the patient has to breathe faster and sometimes breathe deeper to get the oxygen in. So that's quite normal. So the increased respiratory rate is to facilitate the increased metabolic rate that's going to increase the body temperature. So we'll accept 12 to 20 as being in the normal range. Now, very often if someone has a fever, it's going to go higher than that or be high for the individual. So what we say, if it's 21 to 24, they score a two on this, which is worse. And if it's above 25, that, that scores a three. So that would mean increasing levels of illness. If it's fast, we call it a tachypnea. If it's low, we call it a bradypnea. But that's normal there. And you can learn to count those at home, just practicing counting, watching people, watching their chest move, feeling the air in your hand over their mouth. And the other one that's really useful is watching their abdominal movements as well. Now, the next sign we're looking for is oxygen saturations. Now, this is the level of oxygen in the blood. Now, if someone's oxygen saturations are very low, they'll have a bluish discoloration called cyanosis. But otherwise, we've got to use one of these little machines. And we turn that on and we put our finger in there. And then we have a look and see what we get. So we see at the moment, my heart rate is 82 beats per minute, 81 beats per minute, 80 beats per minute. It does sometimes settle down a bit. But we see my oxygen saturations is 98%. Now, these little machines are only about 20 or 30 pounds now to buy. They're, they're quite cheap. I think this one was less than 20 pounds, actually. So it tells me my oxygen saturations are 97, 98. So that is absolutely fine because we accept normal oxygen saturations as being above 96. So above 96 is considered normal oxygen saturations. But if you want to do that, you can only do it if you've got one of these little probes. But as I say, quite cheap to buy now, so you could have one for the home quite easily. Now, the next observation here is body temperature, the temperature of the body. Now, the body temperature should be between normally between 36 and 37 degrees centigrade. But before we score on this, we count a little bit of increased temperature. But when you have a, a fever, that is the body's attempt to increase the body temperature. Because when the body temperature is increased, the viruses don't multiply as well. The viruses don't like being hot, like, don't like warm temperatures. And bacteria, likewise, don't like warm temperatures. So the warmer the body temperature, the more fevered the person is, the more unpleasant the environment is for the infecting viruses or bacteria. So this is perfectly normal. And there's deliberate mechanisms do this in the brain, in the area of the brain that controls temperature called the hypothalamus. So 36 to 37 is considered normal. Now, there's lots of ways to do temperatures. These are the old fashioned uh, thermometers we used to use. So they're, they're fine. But what we often use these days are these electronic ones. So if I just uh, turn that on, I can do it in my uh, forehead, for example. And that tells me that my temperature is 36.4 degrees centigrade, which is about, uh, well, 36 degrees centigrade is uh, 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So 36.4, that's quite normal. And that was a forehead temperature. Now, what you can do is you can take these off as well. And th th I've used this for myself, so I'm not going to put a cover on it. This is like my personal one. So I can put that in my ear and uh, press that again. And that's called a tympanic temperature. 
and we see mine's 36 degrees centigrade. Normally you would expect the tympanic temperature to be higher than the, the skin surface temperature. So when we have a fever, let's just recap briefly. The temperature goes up to make it uncomfortable for the viruses and bacteria. And when the temperature goes up to these fevered febrile levels, it also increases the efficiency of the immune system. So that's good. But that means we need more oxygen in the body to produce the energy to raise the temperature. And also the oxygen saturations, even in a fever, they'd normally stay much the same unless the fever was infecting the lungs. So we wouldn't expect to see a change in that. But if the fever was affecting the lungs and the lungs weren't working properly, then the oxygen saturations could go down, which would be concerning. That can happen, for example, in pneumonia or a condition called acute respiratory distress syndrome, where the lungs themselves are diseased because of the infection and that can lower the oxygen saturations. Now, moving on to the blood pressure. Now you can only take blood pressure with a blood pressure machine. You, you, need a, you need a blood pressure machine. So you could order one of those if you want. But just for your purposes at home, if you're nursing someone with an infection at home, if they can stand up and they don't feel dizzy, the blood pressure is not too low. And as long as they're producing good volumes of urine. So if someone's blood, blood pressure falls into the lower ranges that we don't want, then they would feel dizzy when they stand up or when they sit up because the blood's not being pumped uphill to their brain. Or if their blood pressure was very low, they wouldn't be producing enough urine. So they're indicators of blood pressure at home. And we can also do a test called CRT, capillary refill time. So in capillary refill time, what we do is we press the finger for five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Then we let go. And can you see it goes pink again? And it's supposed to go pink again in less than two seconds. So again, press. Can you see it's gone white now? And I'll let go. And you see it goes pink again in less than two seconds. So we would say my capillary refill time is under two seconds, which is quite good because the reason that these, when I press that on that nail bed there, that's squashing the capillaries, that's why it goes white. Then it goes pink again quickly because the blood pressure is pushing the blood down into my fingers, meaning there's adequate blood pressure in my fingers. So that's another rough guide of blood pressure if the capillary refill time is less than two seconds. Now, the thing where you might get that wrong is if, if it's a very cold day and the person's a bit peripherally shut down because you get cold hands on cold days anyway. But if it's a normal warm room like I'm in now, then that's a good indicator, the capillary refill time. So if all you could do is check my capillary refill time like that, you could say my blood pressure is not, probably not too low. It's, it's refilling quite nice and quickly. And for these observations, you need to do it on yourself and do it on lots of normal people. So if you try yours now and see what yours looks like, and if you're feeling fine, then assume that's normal. Then you can relate the abnormal to your normal observation. If you've got a blood pressure machine to measure that, that's fine. Now an infection, very often the blood pressure doesn't change much to begin with, but if the infection becomes very severe, and the patient gets something called sepsis, then the blood pressure can start to go down. And that is a very serious sign and would require immediate medical attention. Now, the next sign we can look for is a uh, heart rate. And heart rate is, is the pulse rate, how fast the pulse is, is going. So again, if you're being lazy, we can check this with this machine here because that told us that, didn't it? The oxygen saturation machine told us that. What's my heart rate now? It looks like it's about 76 just now. About 76. And my heart rate's about 76 just now. But what you can also do is learn to feel pulses. Now, the classic pulse we feel is this one. It's called the radial pulse. So what you do to feel the radial pulse is you look at the thumb there and the fingers and... On the thumb side, there's like a little bony prominence just there, the radius bone. And then you can see there's, you can see there, there's that tendon that pulls your hand up. So when you put your hand on that and you pull your hand up, you can feel that tightening. Now, the best way to take a pulse is take some fingers like that, put them flat on the surface so they're all, so they're all flat like that. You see my fingers are all flat now. Then put them on that little tendon there 
and then just move off that tendon into that gap just there and give a bit of pressure on there so if you try that now then you'll feel your pulse going through that artery there that's called the radial artery so that's where nurses classically feel for the pulse you can learn to feel pulses in the neck as well there's a carotid pulse in here so i could show you how to feel that one as well sometimes it's hard to feel the peripheral pulses so it's sometimes good to learn to feel these as well so this one you feel for that knobbly bit in the middle your adam's apple there and uh, you press you put your fingers there and you move into the side and back behind that cartilaginous larynx there that you can feel and you press a little bit in there you have to press a little bit because it's deeper and that one's called the carotid artery so you can feel the pulsations of the carotid artery as well and next time you're in the bath there's another one called the femoral artery in your groin that you can practice feeling next time you're in the bath now if someone has a fever then typically the heart rate is going to go up now why do you think the heart rate's going to go up if someone has a fever and it does typically it goes up by about eight nine ten beats per minute for every one degree centigrade increase in in temperature so ju just as a rough guide here 36 degrees centigrade is uh, 96.8 fahrenheit 37 degrees centigrade is 98.6 fahrenheit and 38 degrees is 100.4 degrees fahrenheit but in the uk we always use degrees centigrade in fact most of the world uses centigrade now now to get back to my question why does heart rate increase when you have an increase in fever so if you have a, a fever of two degrees centigrade your heart rate might be 16 17 18 19 20 beats higher than normal why is that well the reason for this is to generate the fever we need to, a lot of energy and to make the energy we need the oxygen as we've already looked at so with an increased respiratory rate but of course the heart has to pump that oxygen around the body to be useful so we have an increased heart rate as well and one of the things about a fever is if you have an increased heart rate because you've been out for a run then when you go to bed your heart rate will gradually slow down again or fairly quickly slow down depends how fit you are <clears throat> and then overnight you'll have a, a low heart rate but if you've got a fever then the heart rate tends to stay up overnight when you're asleep and on this we're accepting 50 to 90 as a normal range that's what we're accepting as a normal range very often we say that a normal sinus rhythm is between 60 and 100 beats per minute now you've got to bear in mind the age of the patient children will tend to have a higher heart rate as a normal physiological heart rate and of course they'll have a higher breathing rate as well young children so this I'm talking about adults here really so um, children will have a higher heart rate and a higher breathing rate but this is the figures for adults so we're taking on this national early warning score 50 to 90 as being normal with a fever and infection it tends to go up that way now um, this is um, this this score here is AVPU a is alert V is response to voice P is response to pain U is the patient is unresponsive so we would write that letter in there as a guide to their level of consciousness now again you can't take blood sugar levels blood glucose levels without a special machine to do that but what normally happens in infection is because you need to produce plenty of energy and the quickest way your body can produce energy is glucose then your blood sugars tend to go up so in infection the blood sugar tends to go up now it's always worth asking if people if they, if they have pain very often in infections there's no localized pain now there are exceptions to this if there's an infection in particular parts of the body like the meninges there can be headache and neck pain if there's pleurisy there can be pain when you breathe in or some types of pneumonia there can be pain associated with breathing if it's what's called a lober pneumonia but very often there isn't any pain but it's always worth asking then we can monitor the urine output we need to make sure patient, patients are producing enough urine output i like patients to produce about 100 mils an hour of urine <clears throat> although we will accept a little less than that if we need to and then we uh, we take responsibility for the observations that we've recorded so all of these things are indications that someone has an infection 
So we can look for these things, these things like the malaise, the pallor, the shivering, the rigor, the fatigue, the altered mental status, the respiratory rate, the oxygen saturations, the temperature, the blood pressure, the heart rate, and uh, the altered mental status. And we can learn to recognise that someone is having an infection as a result of these clinical features because they don't feel well and we need to assess quantitatively if we can why they don't feel well and the reason they don't feel well is they are releasing special chemicals into the blood called cytokines and these are stimulating us not to feel well and stimulating these physiological changes to help us get rid of the infection and it's also the presence of the bacteria or viruses themselves that make us feel ill so these responses are caused partly by the presence of the bacteria or the viruses themselves that are causing the infection and partly by the body's response to the infection. So there are a few basic clinical observations you can start practicing for yourself. Then when someone's ill, you can notice that there's changes in these physiological observations that you notice, there's physical signs and in the symptoms that the patients report to you.